Hi, I'm Nicholas Briggs, and this is The Sirens of Audio. He hasn't accepted me as a friend. Oh, well. <laughs> Suck home. Um. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> G'day audiophiles, this is the Sorrows of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip, I was just watching you to see what kind of energy I was projecting at you today. Because that's what <laughs> bounces back to me. <laughs> oh, well, I was thinking about that when you were actually doing it. I was like, okay, what energy do you have to get back? And then I was thinking, boy, you need a shave. Oh, yeah, I do need a shave. I reckon I should have a shave before the weekend, Dave. Eh? We've got a big weekend coming up. Yes, huge weekend coming. And if you're not doing anything in Sydney on Saturday, get along to Parramatta and meet Janet Fielding. Absolutely. So sun Sunday you can relax. Is that is that how it is for you, Philip? Um, no, Sunday we've got big plans with Janet all day. We're doing exciting Yeah, but the event but the event will be done. The event will be done. And it will either be a huge <laughs> success or I'll be crying and wallowing in uh, self pity. But the event will be done. It'll be nice to get together in person. It, I'm so looking forward to actually meeting you in person. Are you a hugger, just so I know? I can, I'm a hugger. I'm very adaptable, actually. Okay, so, good. Uh, just trying to work yeah. out when I actually first meet you in person, what, what I do with you. Uh, okay, no worries. <laughs> Whatever comes naturally, Philip. Okay, All we'll right. See. Today we are going to be doing what we like to call... We've got randomoids. Ah! Yes, we've got another randomoids episode, and last time the randomoids Selectatron picked a box set which was the novel adaptations limited edition volume one and i was when it when it spat that out philip i was under the impression that it was the first adaptation that came out but it actually was the third adaptation it was the first of the limited edition box sets there was a, right. there was love love and war and the highest science came out beforehand Yes, this one came out because the love hang on love and war came out as a benji special didn't they for her yeah. anniversary which must have been her 10 year anniversary oh 15 i don't know what it was mm. now the first thing we've got to do before we start talking about those and we're going to be talking with the adapter of these stories uh john dorney later on so it's always good to talk with john we have to do one thing philip and that is jump what? down the rabbit hole let's go <laughs> Here we are in the rabbit hole. And I got thinking about these novel adaptations, Philip, because there are 11 in total in the collection. You've been doing your trivia work. You have well done. Yeah, I was curious because I was, I've, I've actually listened to both these stories twice in preparation for this. Wow. Uh, and I'll be able to go into a little bit more as to why I did that uh, when, we're, when we're talking in depth. My question to you is, why do you think the novel adaptations uh, had to be cancelled? Because I think it's well known that they weren't selling so well. So why do you think that might be? Because there are a lot of fans of the books. Uh, so I would have thought that there'd be a lot of people interested in getting these. Why do you think they weren't as successful as Big Finish hoped they would be? You know, that's a really good question. I've wondered that myself. I actually wonder whether that is actually got to do with the fact it didn't sell well or because they were so expensive to produce, they didn't sell enough to, to justify the production. So mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of the shows the Big Finish do, there's you know give and take in terms of actors and, and things. A lot of the box sets that come out, e even things like the uh, the modern box sets, you know, with the Paternoster Gang or Robots, or in, in, even even some of the um, eight eight Doctor box sets. You'll have some large, big scale casts in some stories, and then you'll have just one or two people. Um, so the offsets of some expensive shows manages to offset the, you know, the expensive ones. So, you know, they bounce off each other. These are all expensive to produce. 
because the books have 20 characters plus in them. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how John managed to cut that down because he has managed to cut down the number of characters in these books or in these stories already. And I'm curious to see how he goes about that. But they've still got huge casts. And of course, casts are where the, the, the big money comes from. And so my, suspect, my suspicion is that it wasn't so much that they were horrendously expensive to produce, but that just, so in, in, so in terms of selling wise, it, it's not that they sold a lot less than other units, but that the cost in producing them was so much more because of what was required in terms of casts and, and things to get them ready. So I might be wrong, but that's kind of what, why, what I think is the issue. I, I know people keep saying they want them all the time, but yeah, it's it, they're not coming. Yeah, that's, I think Nick's been pretty clear about that. Well, what do you think? Do you, I mean, do you have a theory? So my theory is that in terms of the, I'll probably go into this more into the review as, uh, uh, when we do it in full as well. But being a novel adaptation, the guys that are involved with adapting these actually love them too. And it's you know it's obvious from the from the liner notes in the the booklet version that I've got, the limited edition version, that Johnny Morris, a script editor, John Dorney, loved these books when they came out. So they wanted to stay as close as possible to the books. But the problem with the uh, the Doctor Who novels is that they're really really densely packed. They're they can be quite complicated, but in a book, you've got the space to do really complicated stuff, whereas on audio, not so much. But they're struggling with the fact that they want to retain as much as possible. And the first book that I thought of that was adapted from the book to a movie that was still very successful as a movie and a book was Blade Runner. So the original book was called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Now, the movie version is very good. But it is nothing like the book. It is completely different. It has been adapted out of, you know, out of all recognition. So I think that uh, in in some ways, perhaps the adapters have tried to stay too close and tried to pack in too much into these, and uh, it's made them a little bit inaccessible for an audio audience. I don't know. That's just a little theory. I, I don't, could be nothing in it, but it's just what got me thinking about it. What do you think? So, so you're suggesting they haven't so because they're not as good. Is that what you're saying? As the it's because they haven't been adapted. No, not not that they're not as good. The story's fine. They haven't been adapted well enough for audio, and they haven't been they haven't used enough license to change them away from the book. Yeah, I think they could have probably changed them more, and they may have been more accessible. Yeah, I mean, it's when, when, I mean, if you take something like Dalek that starts off as a big finished audio Jubilee, it looks nothing like the original audio. And then That's if you right. take and if you take the New Adventure novels, uh, Family of Blood, and then it's to how that was transferred to TV, that has been hugely changed as well. So and and a lot of a lot of that stuff that was in the original has has gone, and mm. that's probably that's probably closer adaptation. But yeah, so in terms of being prepared to actually cut things apart and, and change them. So, I mean, the same thing is true, true for lots of musicals in terms of a successful movie change. I'm just thinking, my, my son's um, in Sound of Music at his school production later in the year. And the stage production of Sound of Music is nothing like the movie. And I think if they tried to do the stage production as the movie, it wouldn't have worked. So the fact that they make these major changes is what makes it work. So, mm. uh, yeah, we'll yeah. be interested to see what John says. I mean, that, one of my questions was in terms of how you change you know, 40, 50,000 words into 10,000. And it's, I think I think adapting things is very hard. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, my plan is to focus with John on how do you adapt? Because that, to me, is the fascinating thing. How do you try and do an adaption of something as big as a novel? And those, no, those novels were dense. Lots of themes, lots of ideas, lots of characters. Yep, maybe. Absolutely. All right, let's jump on out of the rabbit hole and we'll get into the first story, The Romance of Crime. The Rock of Judgment, Court, Prison, and Place of Execution for the Uber Beta Uber system hewn into the skin of a rocket-powered asteroid. Not a good place to be, particularly not for two Time Lords and their dog. Upon arrival on the Rock, the Doctor, Romana, and K-9 find themselves embroiled in the plans of a maverick lawman, but that is just the beginning of their troubles. A highly strung artist gallery holds a deadly secret, and soon everyone's lives will be in danger. They struggle to know who's good and who's bad. A terrible scheme is being unleashed. 
with enemies old and new attacking both sides, can they possibly escape alive? Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Romance of Crime. Hmm, <laughs> carbonaceous asteroid, I'd say. Traces of refractories, accelerated decay of aluminium 26, etc. We're on the fringe of a simulated gravity field. I'd say they're using remote gravitic excitation. Would you? Wilkin, I've found Carl. Carl? It's not pretty. He's been flattened. Duodenium. So possibly an Earth colony? On an asteroid? Strange choice. Well, we won't know unless we get inside. No! You are prisoner! Follow me. Do not attempt to communicate. Any attempt to escape will result in immediate execution. Yes, it usually does. All right. The controls aren't responding! The engines must have been interfered with. And we shall impact the planet's surface at terminal velocity. You must save us, Doctor! What do you think I'm trying to do? Sorry. More stairs, K9? Don't worry. I can carry you. Really? Wouldn't it be better to carry K9? I think you might struggle with me. Big finish. We love stories. Well, Philip, I know you've been busy, so the facts and the trivia, we're going to have to sacrifice that today. Oh, yes. <laughs> we will. Sorry about that. But next time, we'll okay. make sure I've got the dump for next time. What I love about these two stories, and I did listen to them twice, because I... I, I've, I've been trying to think while I've been listening, particularly the first time, I was thinking, what what is it about the, the novel adaptations that make them a little bit less accessible? And I think it is the fact that they're novel adaptations and the writers love them so much that the and the adapters and script editors love these so much um, that they try and pack as much in as possible. So it, it was hard for me to get all the plot details in my head first listen. But what did stay in my head first time around was the dialogue, the characterizations, and the the total homage to season 17, a season that's becoming my favorite classic season. It was a joy to listen to. Funny, the Ogrons, I said last time that the Ogrons are funny. I think they were funnier for me the first time, but I still found them funny. But it's just the, the whole feel of this and the relationship between the Doctor Romana, K9, was all fantastic. Uh, that was the first listen. What about you, Philip? I do remember being very excited when this was announced because I've always loved Tom Baker and Lila Ward together, and so this was going to be the first time we actually saw them together. And, you know, he, we'd had some seasons with Louise Jameson, we'd had some Mary Tam. So mm. I, I remember being very excited when this was announced. It's interesting listening to it again. I have very little memory of it. I do remember enjoying it. I do remember laughing at the Ogrons the first time. I had no memory of the plot whatsoever. So as I was listening to the story, I had no idea plot-wise. I did pick up Miranda Raisin's voice and went, oh, that sounds like Miranda Raisin. I actually went looking to see, and of course mm -hmm. I was right. Yep. So that was great to see Miranda Raisin in a different role. I assume this was, I had to inject that possibly her first role that she did for Big Finish. So really enjoyable story, very dense. And I think I, part certainly I, I struggled because I was trying to do several things at once. It's been a busy couple of weeks, and so it was it was on while I was doing other things. I had my headphones in. And Can't do that with this one. And it was really a, a struggle to mm. follow enough because it, it is very dense. I was just as you just read the blurb, then I was thinking whoever wrote the blurb I was having fun too. The you know, the words <laughs> in there in terms of hewn and um, embroiled, and the, the, I was thinking that someone's having fun with the language. So it was certainly, I mean, and Gareth, Gareth loves the language and all his stories, um, his dialogue, his books are filled with beautiful language, lots of jokes, lots of humour, and this carried all those Gareth hallmarks. So yeah, all up, um, really enjoyed it. I thought it was so well performed. The, as I said, when the Ogrons arrived, it was interesting. Uh, there was little like traces of Genesis, the Daleks music all through it. Duh, duh, there's sort of the, the Dalek music that's in the background of Genesis. Mm. And so I kept, I must admit, I, I didn't think those Daleks. But when Ogrons appear and there was, they, talk, they talked about the fact who's still back on the ship, 
I still go, I think it'd be Daleks in this because I was there was they were just doing those bits of the music. Um, but not yeah, surprising with Nick Briggs directing. Yeah, and Howard Carter just does such an amazing score. Yeah. So it was a brilliant score by Howard Carter. It really was very 1970s as a score. And so to me, it was reflective of Jez the Daleks. But yeah, the a cast, James Joyce or, or, or Jez Fielder, um, once again, <laughs> also you know, having lots of fun. Um, Jane Slave and Michael Troughton. We've, Michael he's Troughton. the standout for me. He's, standout he's, performance, Michael Troughton. Absolutely wonderful. sensational. So just, the whole <laughs> cast were just astounding. So what a cast. And... As I said, I, I do want to listen to it again because I think there's a lot more I could pick up on a second listen. I rarely listen to stories so close together these days. And to do that, it was a really enjoyable experience because I was going back into it going, well, even if I don't get the story, um, I still love the characters and the performances and I was getting a lot out of it anyway. But then on the second listen, oh, yes, all the story fell into place. It was It was a lot easier to understand. And and enjoy just as much on the second listen, so I can recommend that for sure. Yeah, so loved it. Okay, let's move on to The English Way of Death. That seems to be the more popular of the books. Uh, we'll get uh, your thoughts on whether you thought it was the better audio in a second, but here is a blurb. London, in the summer heat wave of 1930, the Doctor is visiting with Romana and K9 in order to return some library books. The traces of time pollution may change his plans. A seaside hut holds a strange secret. A biscuit millionaire is hiring assassins. Deadly butlers and solicitors stalk the streets. There's an odd smell in the air, and it might just mean the death of everyone on the planet. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The English Way of Death. in the telling. Is anything wrong? Uh, just the bureau fussing, I expect. I'll turn it off. What the place is? Is that that closed chair? Sir, the, the, the noise hurts. Stay down, man. What was that? Nothing important. According to these readings, that's a transmission on a spatio-temporal frequency. Oh, interesting. Nobody in this time period can have receivers operating on extratemporaneous wavelengths. What's happening? I'm terribly sorry, young lady. I very nearly ran into you. <laughs> I fell into the road. I blame the local seismic activity. Mr. Stackhouse, construction of the first project proceeds satisfactorily. And the second? Work on cerebral links continue. More nourishment is needed. Alostro. Yeah. Take a look through this on the picture page. There must be no errors. He appears rather distinctive, especially if he wears that hat. There you are, Percy, you naughty boy. No, this is against the rules, Harriet. I'll have to destroy it. One fiddling flying box. June 1930, Southern England. Minor tremor noted at 1747 hours today. It must have been caused by somebody or something alien to this time continuum. What the hell? You... You're coming with me. Keep back. I don't want to have to kill you. Well then, don't... You have completed your examination. But you can't be serious. You can't want it to actually destroy the world. Big finish. We love stories. All right, Philip, you give us your thoughts on the English way of death. Well, once again, it was densely packed story and another really hard slog in some ways to listen to in terms of mm. following what was going on performances once again couldn't fold and what an amazing cast timothy timothy bentek mark bonner terence hardiman jane slaven um there's others yeah others as well but th those are the names that sort of stand out for me in terms of what they've done uh yeah so it was just a exciting interesting romp amazing cast yeah i, I don't know i don't know the stories at all i've not read any of the books um mm. i have i don't know about 10 or 15 um new adventures and what's this part of the adventure range or the missing 
missing adventures. I mean, I have about 10 new adventures, 10 missing adventures. I've not read any of them. I've kept them because I keep thinking I should get to them, but I never have. Should just give them away at some point. Well, sell them. Anyhow, I, I, I've got the Romance of Crime, and I was going to give it a read uh, after listening to it the first time, but I decided to give the stories a second listen rather than rather than read them when, when the time mm. uh, became available for me to do that. Yeah, I think I was just a little bit old when these all the books came out. Right. So I think people in the Busy doing other years, things. Pardon? You were busy doing other things with other life things. at the time. So, it was, so in that hiatus period... I, all Doctor Who sort of had a bit of a settle down for me. I mean, I sort of rediscovered it again mid-20s, but I, I did have a oh, sort of late 20s. So I sort of had a period in the mid-20s where, you know, Doctor was off the air and I just sort of let it slide. And I saw the books around, but never got into them, never bought any particularly. And so this isn't really an era that means a lot to me. I know it means a lot to other people. But I said, it, 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 it tends to be people about 10 years younger than me, other ones who are much more sort of obsessed with the stories. But I did enjoy that adaptations, but I did always feel they were very dense. What, what did you think about this one? A very interesting comparison between the two stories. You've got aliens who are sort of disembodied and then going and possessing people in both. Uh, you've got um, very over-the-top characters in The English Way of Death. You've got um, Percival Closed. And then you've, he, he sort of compared to me to Men Love Stokes in The Romance of Crime. So those two sort of campish type characters there but totally different settings so you've got like gareth roberts tropes in there if you like that he was that he seemed to be using whether he uses things like that in his other stories i have to go back and listen to the higher science because i don't I, I don't recall that story but as far as english way of death goes yeah it was really good i i've never really i've never really been a fan of zombies and zombie stories it never really does it for me um, around the time this was released, I'd say The Walking Dead was really big, wasn't it? And I was never into that. And um, I like the historical setting, though. So, But for me, out of the two, I would have to say Romance of Crime sort of pips it for my preference out of these two in the set. I, hmm. I listened to this one first and then The Romance of Crime. So I think Why my is that? Ear, uh, because I couldn't remember which stories we were doing. And so this was the first one oh. I could remember. And I just right. pulled this up first. No, no, no good reason why. It was just it was just the first one I played. And I think because I listened to this first, my ear was better in for romance. So I certainly enjoyed romance a bit more because I think I knew a bit more what I was listening for. But to be perfectly honest, there are so many characters I really do struggle with. So many characters. Yeah, I, I, I always prefer an intimacy over huge. Um, it, it's it's being reflected more and more in the theatre I go to. That I, I'd rather see two or three people on stage than see fifty in a huge production. Perhaps that's why the adaptations weren't as popular as the they'd hoped. Yeah, Maybe they I, are. They are such big casts and really dense stories. As you, that's that's a good word actually, dense, because they pack it all in. Yeah, it's. And maybe that's that makes it tricky to get sort of into and really invested in. Yeah, I can I say, if people are listening to this, I would love to you to comment on your view of the novel adaptions. Have you listened to them? If you have, what do you think about them? And yeah, are they things that they should? Yeah, people keep writing into Big Fish all the time and saying do more novel adaptions, but they, yeah, I think they have probably made money over ten years, but at the time they really didn't make their money back for a long time. Why do you think? Because you know we've got a couple of reasons. We're not really sure. I'd love to know what other people think in terms of. Why is it they haven't been the biggest hit, the bigger hit that people thought they would be? Yep, for sure. All right, well, that's our take on those two stories. I think it's about time we had a bit of a chat with John Dorney. What do you think? Well, I love talking to John because there's going to be so much energy coming out. Let's go for it. <laughs> okay, we better get ready to reflect back, Philip. Yes, get the energy <laughs> back. John Dorney, thanks for joining us again. My pleasure. Thank you for having me again. Oh, we always love having you. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about adapting. The last time you were on, we talked a little bit about adapting um, the Avengers and the comic strips. And I must yes. say, I've just started listening to the new Tara King today and loving okay. them. They're so funny. But fun, I, get the, yeah. I get the impression that you're working with very few little text, very few boxes. And so mm. therefore, the writers get a lot of opportunity to be very creative and just capture a couple of themes and then go for it. Is that Would that be a fair... Yes. 
Is this uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's it, it's very much a case by case basis. I'll always encourage people. I mean, there's a few times um, Tom and Robert, who have one in this uh, current collection, Tom Selinski and Robert Kahn, yeah, uh, did a storyline where uh, they kind of came up with all manner of new, weird, crazy, but genuinely quite fun ideas. I think it might even be for the story in this set, and. And having to kind of send an email back, kind of going, no, no, that's that's changed the story. We picked this story, uh, so you don't like to add stuff and make it a completely different plot. It's still got to have basically the same thumbnail, for want of a better term. So if you kind of like the the one line pitch of the original comic strip, still kind of has to match the one line pitch. What's the, the so the main a aspect of it? And they keep kind of doing that. If I'm being honest, it's being brief. I, I love them, but it's this bit kind of go, no, we picked this story. That's the yeah. I, the stories they come up with are great. But they're not the story we from the, the comic strip. But um, but even then, there are degrees to which uh, it's variable. Um, I think in terms of the Avengers comic strip specifically, um, I, I think I've come with, with different approaches all the time. Say, for example, the Secret Six um, is kind of very similar, like beginning to middle and end. It's sort of very similar, just expanded. Uh, the Norse code kind of repurposes everything, so it kind of takes place within other bits and. And there's a bit of an over thing around it. Um, one I did, uh, what was it called? You won't believe your eyes. Um, kind of is similar from maybe about the first two thirds, and then goes off somewhere completely different at the end. Because, but in a lot, of, and, and, and that's sort of the same thing with uh, the uh, what happened next, whatever it's called. It, yeah, it, it feels a bit like the, the can't believe your eyes that the espionage bit needs to be pumped up because I think yeah. the Tyra King espionage is really a big part. And the Nigel Fares one I listened to today, it's all espionage. Yeah. You can, you can kind of feel which was the comic bits and then you can see, yeah. see the, and then what is added to it. Oh, you might be surprised. And sometimes the comic strips go completely off piste. I mean, as I say, so I did this one with sort of aliens in it, uh, which is a bit off brand for the Avengers, but even the comic strip has them literally traveling, tra traveling through space to meet Father Time at the end of the universe. And you kind of go, I, have you watched the Avengers? Whoever's writing these. <laughs> And I deliberately... It's like a Doctor Who annual. Yeah. I noticed I'd given a couple of the, the difficult ones to other people and thought, that I took that one on, on the basis of going, well, I've got to have a tough one at some point. But then that one, again, I shifted the plot around to turn it into something a bit different um, because I wanted I needed to make it the Avengers. And, and so there are a few like that where... Yeah, maybe the premise at the start, maybe the first like five or six pages are there and then goes off piste. Others uh, are very close to the strip in terms of generally the plot just expanded and others do different things with it. So it, it there's never a one solution fits all. Is that, is that the phrase? I'm not sure it is. Uh, one size fits solution. Um, and uh, yeah, you kind of take each case as they come, really. Yeah, but it's fun to do. I always kind of really enjoy doing them, yeah. Okay, so today we're discussing the romance of crime and the English way of death, which are very mm -hmm. early in the novel adaptions range. In fact, we think yeah. they may have been recorded first, even though they were third and fourth released. Um, uh, no, I, no? I, I, I think it was the first one, is it Love and War, isn't it? Or something um, like that? Yep. I think it was a few years beforehand. Um, it was very early days. Though. It was the first sort of ones done as a big sort of uh, box, I think. Because I think, yeah, Love and War and high science kind of outliers at the beginning and then and then we kind of did a big batch of quite a few of them i, th I, th I think it was initially very we were just planning on doing the two the big box set and then th then there were questions of well should we do the other uh, gareth roberts book uh or the don baker book um and and what we would do alongside that and and there was generally a look at, you know i can remember having writing up a list and kind of going through what other books there were and which ones had hooks and things that would be interesting to make with them. So that kind of mix of what's got a good reputation, what's got a good, got a good hook, what can you kind of bring in? And, had uh, Tom and Lara, Lala been in any stories before this? Was this the first time? I think it's the first one, yeah. yeah. I, I remember being very excited to buy it because they were both in it, even though yeah. I know they weren't, didn't actually record together. Well, I mean, or did they, didn't they? We don't know. This is the oh. I know people will always say, people will always say, I mean, I, I don't think we've ever officially said whether they do it. I mean, you know, I think you can probably take a reasonably good guess. But people always say you can hear. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's always a bit dodgy saying when people haven't recorded together. The thing is, you genuinely can't. Because no, the reason people think with this one, they kind of go, oh, you can hear they're not together. Um, 
is because there's a reasonable reason to assume they're not together. The amount of times people have not recorded together is way more than you think. Um, because most of the time you don't notice. There is one story of mine where literally every single person on it, in it recorded on a different day. No one was working with the other cast and no one has said uh, that you can hear or you think they're not in the room together because it, it's you don't notice. It's this whole thing of like, um, uh, I think it's like like with uh, uh, Abita Sufi is the kind of the first one they do where they kind of like cuts and your brain fills in the gaps. So if there is a slight disconnect between performances um, you, your brain as a listener goes, oh, that's because of this. And you kind of make up a reason. Uh, whereas if you're kind of thinking already, they're not in the room together. You don't do that. You kind of go, oh, I can, the, I hear the disconnect. I think that's why people kind of go for it. But they, I've always used the example, particularly in regards to, um, uh, in, in regards to this one, in the, into these ones, always a bit of going, you say Tom and Lana are in the same room, and then, and you can tell, and you have this bit go, so you can tell, can you? Who's John Leeson recording with? in those scenes, because he can't be recording with both of them, he's recording with one of them. And if you listen to all of them, that's always the case. And, you know, it's, it, you, you you can't tell. There's, again, actually, there's a scene in one of these. Um, and again, I won't say which one it is, but again, there are three people in the scene and every single one recorded on a different day. Every single one. And nobody's ever noticed it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would never suggest the fact you can tell that there's a separate... Yeah. I said for me, for me, the exciting thing was the fact that they were together. But and let's face it, the fact that you've done all this pre-recording separately meant that Big Fish was forced out for COVID. So when no one was yeah. going to be in the same space together, no. um, and still make it work. And I mean, yeah. they can still be, you know, working together at the same time, mm. like down the line. But um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's bring brought a whole new set of working conditions into it. I think yeah, I think it was the first release we had of them together. I can't entirely remember. I think we were recording. I have a feeling we were recording at the same time, like the releases that were going to happen out, but because we worked quite far in advance with the Toms, they took longer to come out. So it's, every now and then people are like, say, with regards to like, you know, the, the adaptations of say, Return of the Cybermen, you've got to so say, well, I'd rather have, I'd rather have actual like brand new stories with um, the fourth Doctor, Harry and Sarah, and you go, you do realise that that doesn't stop the, that having a Return of the Cybermen adaptation I mean, doesn't mean you can't, you can still have those. They may still happen. Um, and it's not like we're recording every single day of the year and every, you know, the, we've got these two. That means there's less. No, it's just a bonus story. And that's quite fun to have. So I think, um, yeah, I think we were recording the initial runs of um, the Tom Lala stuff roughly around the same time. But I mean, those ones, I think those were the first ones that came out because they came out separately to his regular range. So what were your feelings about the uh, the original novel? I think you and Johnny and David all had very fond memories of, of those those two yes. novels in particular, didn't you? Yeah, it was sort of my, it was, well, it was sort of all my teenage years um, was um, reading uh, the, a lot of the Missing Adventures and the New Adventures and, um, and, and Gareth's Missing Adventures in particular were Kind of generally regarded, I think, as the sort of the, the, the standouts of the range. I think, like, you know, if anyone does a poll, he has the top four spots. Um, and usually it's English Way of Death at the top. Though I have a faint feeling I kind of always preferred Romance of Crime. Um, but, um, and, and there's, you know, there's a reason Well Mannered War was considered to like close off the range. It's because he was um, the epitome of it. I think that it was because there was the whole thing at the time that I think there's still kind of around the edges of the Trad versus Rad thing if you've heard of that. And, and effectively that was to a degree, new adventures versus the missing adventures. So the missing adventures have this sort of vibe, a lot of the time of recreating the past. So again, you know, not always. Not, that, that, Gareth did that a lot um, and so impeccably well that that's kind of viewed as almost what it is, but there are still, you know, missing adventures that go, you know, go off piste and, you know, have Dodo getting sexually transmitted diseases and things like that, which, you know, you, you, your, your tastes, uh, how, how, how well that works is entirely dependent on your taste, and it's quite a fun thing to see. Fun is the wrong word, you know what I mean. Um, uh, but yeah, Gar Gareth did what Gareth did terribly well, and that meant he was a very good fit for that specific kind of missing adventure, which I think why he ended up like focusing on them. Um, and there are other people like, say, Paul Cornell, who kind of is a, a bit more on the, sort of the rad side, for want of a better term, and focus quite hard on that sort of thing. But then that's kind of the joy of it, is that you can have both of those happening simultaneously. And I kind of wouldn't particularly want one to be really focused on that kind of thing more than the other, or if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, I remember really having 
sort of a great time with the books. I'd loved The Highest Science when it came out. Kind of loved the plotting of that and the, the actual sort of twi twist at the end of that I thought was really clever and fun. So I was automatically looking forward to these. Um, I think, weirdly, kind of revisiting them, it was, it was a sort of fascinating experience because I remembered, I, I, I think with both of them, you're not kind of, with, with, with specifically English and, and Romance of Crime, maybe less so with well Man at War and The Plotters, you're kind of not really remembering the plot as such, you know, I think the they, they are considered standouts pretty much because of the recreation of the era and the fact it's these you know, sort of terribly funny and clever books. Uh, but that is kind of an issue with adapting them in a way, because because a lot of the stuff you would trim away, like the the, the fat and the sort of fat, the bits you kind of have to keep is the plot, uh, and you'd almost like cut away half of the bits around the edges of it and go, ah, but those are the bits people want. They kind of don't want the plot as such. They want the fun bits around the outside. I've said this a few times, but there's also a degree where I think people don't aren't as interested in plot as they think they are. A clever plot is fun and it's a bonus, but you people like character and 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 jokes and dialogue and things like that. That that's what gets you involved in the story. The story itself doesn't necessarily have to be insanely original. And I realised this quite definitely with English Way of Death and Romance of Crime, where it's been a while since I've read them or listened to them. So I can't be quite. As specific as that, but I remember, I think I did English Way first for some reason, I can't remember why, and then Romance second. Um, and I kind of found myself going, These have got the same plot, haven't they? They kind of do. They're sort of this sort of evil being who's like punished and imprisoned and like removed from physical reality, trying to uh revive themselves in, in, in by possessing other people. I, I can't remember entirely, but, but I remember going through them kind of going. These are, this is the same central setup, but just in a different location and with different jokes. And and not that I'm, I say, not that I'm saying that's a bad thing because it, they've got a really different atmosphere and a different style. But the actual nuts and bolts of the plot, very similar. Which as I said, well, Man of War, very different, but uh, and plotters different again. But those two, I kind of found myself going, oh, these aren't these aren't too dissimilar, really. So in terms of adaptation, a, yes, a, a four-part big finished script is usually how many words? Uh, 20,000, give or take. 20,000, four parts. How, what's a novel in terms of word oh, count? Oh, what 80 knows. 80 um, or more? Something like that, yeah. So, so how, how do you go about getting a book like The Romance of Crime and then saying, I'm going to turn this into four episodes when you have so many characters in the book, um, yeah. some, you know, a number of different plot lines happening. You want yeah. to be able to maintain enough plot lines to make sure the Doctor and Companion at least are involved mm. enough to make them make it worthwhile w what's your process for turning a novel into a script well i mean at, li at the very least with gareth's ones they were so defined as like specific episodes so each one was written as a four-part story so automatically you're at the point of then going well i've got to get that one down to five thousand and that one down to five thousand and that one and so it kind of gave me a smaller target, which is quite a good way of approaching these things, I felt. Um, and uh, so it meant I kind of went the piecemeal. I seem to remember at least one of them. I think it's English way, might be well-mannered. Uh, episode one of one of them is really long. Like, like it's like frustratingly long, where you're kind of going, oh, okay, like I'm balanced. And I'm still going, well, I still got to try and trim that down. Um, I mean, a lot of it you kind of lose already by virtue of the fact there is you know prose to trim and uh and and sort of obviously visual sequences you can get rid of and then it's just sort of looking for connections and condensing and finding ways of cutting scenes together because i think i basically took the, the actual process was kind of almost what you imagine i took a, a full version of the text and then sort of trimmed away what i could and saw what i had then and then kind of going through it on a case by case basis going okay how can i get from there to there most of the time i, I seem to remember it was relatively relatively painless um there were a few bits um i seem to remember english way in particular um the the the, the sort of the older couple which i think is i want to say Ab abigail mckern and um oh, i can see his face i've worked with him on various other things um yeah the, the colonel guy or whatever it is like they kind of got like a, a long sort of introductory sequence lots of sort of meat cute stuff happening before they end up and and i think i trimmed that down to about one scene um because you kind of needed to um and a lot of it wasn't plot and th there are bits like that you're just looking for bits going what is just color what is plot 
but at the same time not wanting to lose jokes. I think the really difficult bit with English Way was that English Way had a really obvious cut, like a really obvious one, because it was this massive car chase in episode two, from what I remember. And and so visual and didn't really, you know, it was an action sequence, but didn't actually really further the plot because obviously they get there. The, the bad guys don't capture them and kill them. You can cut it. You can just get through it. Uh, unfortunately, that's the bit where the policeman, uh, the, the green misty policeman comes from. And I thought the, everyone knows that cover. Or well, if you remember the book, you remember that cover. And if you're getting the English way of death, you want a green misty policeman on the beach. And it's this bit we're going, right, how do I... How do I squeeze that in? So having to find a way, an awkward way of putting that in um, was was probably the, the the toughest challenge of the second one because I felt, well, I've, I've got to cut the car chase, but then still find a way of getting the, the guy disguised as a policeman without it seeming terribly contrived because uh, that's basically what we wanted on the cover as well because it's, you know, the image you associate with the story. Yeah. How much dialogue do you keep from the original book? Oh, um, as much as possible. Um, every now and then, uh, I'd throw in my own dialogue, um, and it, you know, to cover plot details. But with with anything like that, I also did this with like the Avengers TV script adaptations. Um, I feel that it's at least part of my responsibility to keep the dialogue from the original wherever possible. Gareth's a really good dialogue writer as well. Let's let's be honest, and particularly in, in this period, so. I wouldn't really wanted to change it that much. I think I changed a bit more with something like to say too many targets. Um, um, but um, yeah, it, it, it felt like you, you're kind of here for the dialogue and you're here for Gareth's particular voice um, in those uh, those stories. So yeah, I think I kept as much of it as I could and and yeah, stripped it back. So so yeah, the amount of dialogue I kept was approximately 20,000 words of dialogue, <laughs> obviously. So maybe maybe about 18,000 words. So yeah, um, and then filling in the rest and whatever I needed to add as a description, but then still trying to keep it. I'm, I definitely got a memory. I can't for the life of me remember what it is, but there's a joke in there that is 100% mine. That I, 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 oh, I think it might be something about, um, I, th I think it might be Romana paying canine a compliment at the doctor taking it. I feel it's them going downstairs. Yeah, there's like, there's, that, that isn't there. I think that's me, but I think that's because it just, Yes, oh, there was, there was yeah. another one about carrying carrying K nine up the stairs, and the doctor says something along the lines of "I'd be a bit heavy." Yes, there's something something around there that I think was me. Um, it's weird, but, I th but it's weird, but it shows you in a way how how little I had to tweak and change the dialogue because I can remember one specific line in there that's mine because mainly that's going. That's a good joke. I'm putting that in, and then I can't. I remember nothing, having to add nothing else anywhere else. Um, yeah, that's sort of quite. Um, fun yeah do you think all writers can adapt or is it a particular skill oh i mean that's a weird qu that was because that's, that's a weird, that kind of sounded sounded insulting i didn't mean no, it like that's that. okay. that's, weird. I've, that's never really, I've never really considered that i think um i i i, I think it's a it's a different state of mind i suppose i think um and I think there's always going to be a different approach to it, really. I think, uh, I mean, depends if you, you know, I mean, the thing is with these, I my specific approach has almost always been to try and maintain as much of the original as possible and leave my voice out of it. Uh, but other people will go in, you know, in a different way and try and like own the material. And sometimes that can be a, sort of a, a legitimate approach as well, really. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's, I, I suspect most writers I know could probably do it because we've got enough sort of sense of storytelling and dialogue and uh, and things like that. But um, you'd sort of have some way of doing it, even if it's not necessarily the same way every single time. Yeah, I think as it's, I mean, I, I suppose it's, it's an editor. An editors are quite, would definitely be able to do it because I think that's probably the thing that helped me out is that I, you know, as a script editor, I'm kind of already looking for things that could be cut and trimmed. And yeah, so and every now and then I'm having to effectively adapt somebody else's script because uh, you know, we've reached the point where I need to finish it because it's not quite done yet and we've got a time frame and I need to kind of tweak and change things according to what we need. Um, so I've probably sort of been trying to, I think there would be people who probably would be less interested in doing it, 
and um, and I know I know there are certainly like some people who have said I don't want to be a script editor. With with romance of crime, John, you had uh, the opportunity to do a bit of acting too. As, yes, uh, as an ogron, tell us about that experience. Oh, I got to be one of the ogrons and one of the brothers, didn't I? Um, I, I think that was uh, sort of nominally a reward for having been uh, like voicing K nine on a few occasions to read in as like stunt K nine when John wasn't available, um, and. And, and that occasional thing of going, because because that's slight frustration where you kind of go. Jane would all, uh, often read in for other characters, and would they get play another part in it and and be paid? And I'd be there and I wouldn't be being paid because I was the writer. And he's going, maybe just would you like to give me a part in one of these at some point, just so you know it'd be fun. And, and I sort of suggested being yeah one of the um, one of the one of the brothers. And then an ogron because I like doing ogron voice, uh, even though they're you know considered problematic these days uh, for varying reasons. Uh, which are, you know, understandable. Um, yeah, it was, uh, that was, I, you know, I loved doing the performance things and also kind of loved the general silliness. Actually, my main memory of that was there's one line uh, delivered because I, I knew, um, oh, I've forgotten the guy who plays the detective in it, whose name is, weirdly, is the same as somebody from history. But he was, he's the, yeah, he turns up in various other things in like Broadchurch and things like that. And I knew him in advance from other things we've worked on. Um, and uh, he was recording, and it was me, him, and Lala in the booths. Was and it Marcus? Marcus Garvey? Marcus, yes. Mar Mar Marcus Garvey, yes. Uh, Marcus was sort of a few booths down, and then Lala was in the middle. And uh, and there, there's the, the Ogrons being terribly stupid have this, uh, this bit where they kind of say, oh, you, uh, the, the brothers have no friends, so they are not speaking to you. And then the doctor kind of phones up again and goes, are, are, so are you, are you an Emmy? Yes, yes. Are, are you an Emmy? Yeah, 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 yes, I am. Uh, well, then we can pass it on. Uh, Mr. Mr. Medics or whatever his name is, uh, we have enemy for you. And then he kind of answered the call. But there was one time when just out of nowhere, I kind of was like sort of delivering the lines. Uh, what, what, what the hell are the names of the brothers? Um, because uh, the, Nis the Nisbets. The Nissen. Oh, yeah, Mr. Nisbet. Yeah, because it was really the line was something like, Mr. Nisbet is enemy for you. Is how I think I deliver it. But the version I did the first time was I kind of um, said, "Ah, you are enemy of Mister Nisbet." Then I would fetch it for you. Mister Nisbet is enemy for you, and just caught Lala and Garrett's eyes, Marcus's eyes, and just burst into laughter because you go, "This is so silly. That's ridiculous, Mister Nisbet." <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of I don't know if that one was the version that made it in. I kind of wish it was, uh, but because it was just so genuinely stupid and kind of like it actually rings a bell. I think it might be in there. Oh, is it great? I think yeah. so. But that was or something favorite. very similar. Yeah, just just for the moment of looking to Lala and, and, and Marcus and just both pissing us all all of us pissing ourselves with laughter after and just the kind of oh what the hell am I doing? That's kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, yeah, they was fun. yeah. So it was the Nisbet brothers. I was one of the Nisbets. I was yeah. I was one who gets one who talks like this. I think I'm probably a bit broad in it. I'd probably soften that performance a bit. Having heard it, it's one of those ones going. Eh, meh, meh, meh. One of one of the performances I've occasionally done where I think um, yeah, well, I'd tweak that now I've heard it. So had a fun one of those. So this is an anecdote. I I haven't told anyone. Given the Avengers comments earlier, this is just a, a fun little story. So I was uh, I was listening to one with my mother. And and we kind of did this drive through to the end, and and he said, so what did you think of that? It was one of my scripts. I said, what did, did you think of that? She said, oh, it was it was it was it was it was yeah, generally pretty good. I mean, I thought I thought the performance of the guy who's like doing the sort of the Cockney henchman was a bit over the top, but the, but by the time it got to the end, I sort of I, fig I figured out why. And going, yeah, I said, right, yeah, yeah, mum, you do realise you do realise who was playing that, don't you? And she just went, what? Um, oh, was it you? And I went, yes, it was, mum. <laughs> So I considered that I considered that actually kind of a compliment that she hadn't realised it was me. And also, as I say, she did say, but I did say that I figured it out why it needed to be that over the top by the end. Go, yeah, because there are reasons within the plot why the, the Cockney henchman needs to be a bit broad. Um, but it was just kind of hilarious. We kind of go, yeah, thanks for that, Mum. Thank you. As far as these stories go, though, you're allowed to be over the top with anything yeah. season 17 related, yeah. though, aren't you? Yes, absolutely. That's the thing, and and I, and I think we, you know, all kind of had a great time. With it. I mean, I see I, the other thing to mention there was obviously that reminds me, of Michael Troughton just making me sort of cry with laughter as as, as Men Love Stokes, um, 
which is just such a glorious character and um and and so kind of i, I seem to remember like like pitching his voice so high it would actually like set the music stand that people had the scripts on ringing because <laughs> that would just kind of like he, he, he which i'd never heard happen before but he could just like go up and up you know all, all around there it was the, quite high yeah he's, yeah he's such a good actor <laughs> michael and um yeah i i one of the most sort of hugely underrated actors working out that he's just really good and really funny and just clever and yeah got a lot of love for michael Jackson. I found that um, when I was younger, I was very, very serious as a Doctor Who fan, and I always gravitated yeah. towards the early Tom Bakers. But I think from about the from a late twenties onwards, the season the, the the Williams years have just got more and more important to yeah. me as a fan, and I, I they're, they're my preference now. I'm, I'm I think I'm so old now. I prefer to Graham Williams to anything else. Fourth Doctor. Oh, I can enjoy a lot of Graham. There's a few things that are kind of I think help with that. One is this thing that um, like particularly classic series all looks shit now so you know the, the it, all all of this the the, the 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 scenery the sets the monsters it all looks crap it doesn't matter because i think you know back in the day when i was growing up it was all that bit going oh yeah like the ones set in victorian england and the past look a bit better than the future ones um with you know those, those sort of graham williams spaceships where it all looks hideous but now you gotta go yeah even the even the historical stuff looks really studio bad and rubbish and the monsters all look rubbish and i cut but i still kind of love it because you know you, you can see beyond that suspension of disbelief but you need the same suspension of disbelief all the way through the other thing i, I long since had this theory when i was sort of growing up i was kind of noticing the ones i liked i liked a lot of the funny ones it's like you know that thing of going you've been told forever that the romans is bad because it's a comedy and the gunfighters is, is the worst story ever and they're both quite good fun and they're and great. all the things you're offered, you kind of watch them and go actually this is sort of rubbish isn't it and and I began to kind of pick the one I was, I always got fascinated by the stories that fandom generally decided were the classics and the ones they generally decided they didn't like. And there were a lot of things that are similar. Um, so uh, lots of deformed men, lots of like, so like Davros and, and, um, uh, Greel. Boris Jack and Greel, so all of these Jack, people yeah. where it's like, you know, people have been, you know, um, injured horribly. Um, and there's lots of sort of lots about violence and lots of historical settings and, and all of those kind of things that all sort of fit in. And I began to have this realization of going, oh, so a lot of the ones that people are thinking are good are the ones that are kind of more obviously adult, aren't they? They're kind of like kind of go, oh, look how adult we are. We, we're violent. We're gritty. We've got people who have like experience of horrible agonies. And all of the ones that people were going against, like the Williams era stuff, were stuff where you're going oh it's got lots of jokes and it's sort of a bit light-hearted and 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 occasionally a bit silly and it's these things that i think people would conceive perceive as a tiny bit childish um but then obviously that's i think that's the, the whole thing about about um the embarrassment factor people kind of thinking oh this is widely regarded as a children's show i i i'm not going to like the ones that, that that i think might make it look childish the ones i might be embarrassed watching this in front of other people uh, and I think that's what they go. This, this kind of oh, you know, you'd always see all these reviews going. Well, imagine watching this with someone else, and you kind of go, imagine watching broad, broadly any of it with anyone else. I wouldn't watch Tellers of Wen Chiang with anyone else, you know. And I've I've shown things to other people where they kind of find, you know, my ex girlfriend found Genesis of the Daleks. To, I didn't watch it with her. She watched it with her child. She watched Genesis of the Daleks, quite dull, but really like Creature from the Pit. And and that sort of this, what we perceive. Of what other people might enjoy is is really different, and they're going to hate all of it. So it's just as big. So yeah, I think the older you get, the more mature you get. You kind of go, oh, actually, um, people shooting each other all the time isn't the height of maturity, and the other stuff being silly. The funny stuff is kind of a bit more mature. I still think sort of my favourite dumb bit in pretty much the whole of Doctor Who. There's a few, but one of my favourites is exactly the epitome of this of that kind that kind of all oh, look how macho we're being. And it's it's right at the end of Resurrection of the Daleks. It is Lytton kind of staring over this, this entire uh, room of bodies and kind of going, they're all dead and so are you. And then he shoots the trooper who's next to him, who we've never met. It's just some guy with a mask on. You kind of go, what the hell is that supposed to be? That's just stupid. That is just like, oh, I'm killing a random... You know, yeah, you're, oh, you're so hard. It's just, you know... Well, let's bring him back yeah. to the hero at the end of the okay. year's time. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, what, so what we're saying, the season, season 17 is just fun. And yes, some of the, sometimes it goes a little bit far 
um, probably. But again, you can, I kind of really love the plots of it. I remember like watching Creature from the Pit again and just finding how sparkling that dialogue is. The, the, the actual, it's filled with so many beautiful lines and jokes. I've got issues with Creature from the Pit. I think, you know, it's ever so slightly weird structure that David Fisher occasionally does of stopping the plot five minutes into episode four and then having to come up with a completely different plot for the rest of the rest of the story. But but it's filled with character and dialogue. And, you know, Destiny can be perhaps a tiny bit dull. Nightmare, from, Nightmare of Eden has, has a fantastic plot. That's a really good one. And you get past the monsters and, the, the, you know, some of the dialogue, you, you, you'll have an absolute blast. Sharda, I love. Uh, Horns of Nyman, I think, is a hoot as well. Again, again, it's just these things go, just don't worry about the effects and stuff. So, yeah, I feel that that is... I mean, and obviously City of Death is truly magnificent in every way. So yeah, that's um, season 17 for you. That was a, that was a bit of a tangent and a rant. Taking it back though, uh, listening to yes. Romance of Crime and English Way of Death, these would have fitted season 17 perfectly and it kept taking my mind to that era uh, yes. and just made me appreciate uh, Douglas Adams and Graham Williams, particularly season yes. 17, even more, even more than I've ever done before. Yeah. So. Uh, as a, as a result of that of these stories, so because I wasn't I wasn't a novel reader, so this was great. Op- you know, these are a great opportunity for me to get into the the novels that I hadn't hadn't really. I'd only read a few of them, and I never really got into them. So these were fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were talking earlier about the fact that people keep requesting these to be turned to audios, and yet they haven't sold that well. Not sold in terms of the range continuing. Um, we've been speculating, coming up with our own theories about why they haven't sold as well as other things. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have any idea in terms of what, what the issues were in terms of why you think they haven't been able to make the money back? I think they're, I mean, I, I imagine they have made the money back now, but I don't know, I, I don't know the degrees of the, the logic of things. I think there are things like, I, I've never done the maths, but I've tried to like keep an eye on the cast list, so I didn't try to keep the cast list too big. So whether it's a sort of cost of making it versus amount you get back but I think in terms of adaptations I think there is this sense there's a few things I think I think there is the sense of well the story exists somewhere else so you might rather spend your money on something you don't know already it's like I often don't go into you know I remember like what was it saying um I've never felt the urge to watch the Da Vinci Code film because I read the book and I, I, I don't know why I'd want to see that and why I'd pay money to go and see it or buy the DVD because you go I've got the I, I don't have the book anymore, gave it away but it, it there's that, isn't there? I think that, and, and even things, you know, I've like not felt the urge to watch. I, I quite, I quite enjoy in in the sort of guilty pleasure thing, something like the Jack Reacher books, and the, they are the same plot about the same three plots repeated. They are and they're not very good, but kind of entertaining, and you can read them in a week. But I've not felt the urge to watch the TV version of that, not least because you know, in that case, you kind of go, I don't want to watch this for eight hours. I don't think it can. You know, reading the book it can keep me a bit engrossed, but no. So I think there's possibly that, just this sense of if you're going to spend your money, you would potentially rather spend it on something you don't already know. And I appreciate and, and it. So it's either people who know the stories and have them who they go, okay, I might wait for it to till it's on sale or something like that. And then alternatively, there are people who have uh, not got them, who might be put off by, thing, by things like, you know, incomplete storylines. So you've obviously we've got like Love and War, but not Deceit and, and Lucifer Rising and got the higher side and having Damaged Goods come out before Original Sin, things like that way. And, and then not having Return of the Living Dad or Survival of Sin or things to pay off some of these things. So um, I suspect that's possibly some of the factors of it. Um, you know, which is a shame because I mean, obviously in a lot of cases, they're kind of really hard to get hold of now and there's some absolute belters in there and there are quite a few you know i think we'd probably be tempted to do and and you know maybe it'll happen again at some point maybe it will maybe it won't i don't entirely know but just you know it's, it's worth waiting to see i think so occasionally it whispers that it might you know people might try something but i don't it doesn't seem to come to fruition to any major degree i speculated on on an adaptation that i really love and that's uh, yeah. blade runner so if you think oh, yeah. about Bl- Blade Runner, is the movie is totally different from the book in every almost every way, apart from a couple of the yeah. characters. Could that also be an issue that, that you may be trying so hard to stay with the book that the books are just too big for audio and they need to be stripped back a bit? 
a bit more or um, is that a possibility? I mean, some of them may be. Yeah, some of them. Uh, I don't think the, the Gareth Robbins particularly. I, and I and say with Original Sin, I was quite surprised. We didn't. We talked about, oh, do we make this a six-parter or a three-disco? I can't remember whether we do it in like half-hour episodes or, or not. Um, but I eventually was going through going, no, I think this is two. I think that we can do this in two. Um, and that's probably the strongest way of doing it. But yeah, I, 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 you know, these things are always possible, I'd say. Yeah, um, there might be somewhere where it feels like it might become unwieldy doing it. But I, 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 at the same time, I do feel that you could probably tell a good few of them in at the, at the very least three discs, at the very most three discs. I feel that, and, and of course there are others where, you know, they come from a different era, so they might be difficult to replicate. As, you know, aforementioned, dodo std um things might be tricky getting past um the bbc these days um but um i, I don't even then i'm not entirely sure that it's that often that that happens really um and certainly a lot of it you could lose in adaptation you know if you're doing transit which would be potentially a good one to attempt to you know transit and also people double bill for you know the, the aronovich fans um you don't have to include too much of the stuff that people were a bit kind of oh my god swearing at the time um yeah you, you could obviously like take a different approach to these things for sure great john thank you so much for your insights as always well thank you for having me yes it's been a pleasure we are visitors mr crump and if they get in our way it'll be a pleasure to punch their tickets From Big Finish Productions, The Avengers, Steed and Tara King, the comic strip adaptations, Volume 7. If I may have your attention, everyone, you are surrounded. I assure you, there is no escaping. I wouldn't put it quite like that. Oh, ooh, nice shoes. Thank you. No, I wasn't talking about yours. Uh, I meant his. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> I'm not surprised it hurts. Put some ice on it. It's huge. Well, this is only a fraction. Are you two train spotters? Not as such, though we've spotted a few lately. Break, man! Break! Hold tight! You really think a steam train can catch up with a runaway diesel? Catch it? I hope we can overtake it. There she blows! <laughs> oh, it's stuck! Then unstick it! I'd rather not become a permanent sleeper. Oh, I'll take this! Assassin, embezzler, and terrorist. Wanted in a hundred countries and across five continents. What's to stop him killing us all before he leaves? Be silent, English woman. Well, Miss King? That was a job well done. Mm, this one's very tasty indeed. Big finish for the love of stories. Well done, Mr. Steed. Well done. All right. Fantastic chat, as always, with John, Philip. Yes, he has so much stuff. We did go off track a bit there, but it's so much fun. It's Even talking it. about the Avengers. Well, the Avengers has just come out, so... Well, Avengers is a bit adaption. We're talking about this, uh, all the other Doctor Who stuff we started talking about and things. Yeah. Assuming, assuming you've left it in there, Dwayne. We, oh, we, I'll leave it in. Don't yeah, we, 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 okay, good. We went off track, but boy, it was fun. Because it's there's nothing... Isn't it exciting talking to Doctor Who fans and when mm. they get passionate? And I love John because he just loves Doctor Who. And his passion just starts to fly. So, yeah, love talking to him every time. All right. Uh, that only leaves us uh, one thing to do, and that is to get the Randomoid Selectatron to select our next stories for uh, the April edition of... We've got Randomoids. Ah! I was waiting for the squeal, Philip. Ah! Oh, there you go. There it is. All right. Let's get the Selectatron going, and we'll see... I think the music should be going by now. That's me self-editing, folks, if you hadn't already realised. <laughs> okay. 
The very first one we've got is a main range story, Sixth Doctor and Charlie. Oh, fantastic. We haven't, we haven't done one of those before. It is uh, main range number 124, uh, Patient Zero, a Dalek story. So that'll be good. Uh, I and haven't heard that for a long the, time. Towards the end of her reign with the Vians, is that what they're called? Which is now yes. just travelling with? They are Vians on the on the cover. There okay. you go. I, yeah, I, 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 I've listened to the story. Well, I actually listened to all the Charlie stories in order not that long ago. She's probably a couple oh. of years. She's probably a couple of years now. But yeah, I, this is what, this is a great one. Fantastic. Looking forward to hear that again. Okay, second one. Let's give it a spin. Oh, we haven't done an early adventures before. Uh, no, they're my favourite. I like these ones very much. It's uh, the first Doctor. The Ravelli Conspiracy by Robert Kahn and Tom Selinski. There you go. Okay. So we're going to do that one. Uh, so that features Peter Purvis and Maureen O'Brien. Peter Purvis doing Stephen and the First Doctor. So, yeah, I'm excited to go back to that one. So that's a, not quite as old as Patient Zero. 2016, that one came out. Uh, but that will be uh, what we're going to talk about for next month's We've Got Randomoids. Now, normally fantastic. we do recommendations for... Uh, something that we've been listening to, but I reckon if you're anything like me, and you're probably more than like me, Philip, we've been flat out organising this event with Janet Fielding. So, well, let's recommend going to Sydney or Hobart or Brisbane and seeing Janet Fielding, or booking tickets for Sophie Aldred, who's coming to yes. Sydney as well. Sophie Aldred uh, with uh, is appearing with the Sirens of Audio in May, May the 13th, I believe it is. Yep. is and right? speaking of no novel actions, we've also got John Blum and Kate Orman coming to that day to be interviewed and talk about their writing, both for Big Finish, but also for the new adventure range. That's very, uh, yeah, very good Good reminder there. Well, it's an announcement, really. We haven't well, that's probably an before, announcement. I'm not sure we've actually told anyone that before, so. <laughs> there we go. New announcement. So it's better, out there now. I better put something out there now to let you know. So we've got... We got three guests so far for the Sophie Aldred. Sophie, yeah. John, and Kate. So far, yeah. and just just in terms of people knowing, in Brisbane, to um, Jason Hay Gallery is coming to to Brisbane, and so he'll be there to be interviewed and talking to. There's some special deals, by the way, for Big Finish people who attend. Um, Big Finish have been very generous and and given us a couple of deals that we can give to people who attend the events. And Rove McManus in Hobart is coming to join Janet. And mm -hmm. Robert McKnight, who for Brisbane people would know him on the radio as well, is doing the interviewing in Brisbane. So uh, Spencer Housen, actually. Oh, Spencer Housen. Robert McKnight's going to be there, but Spencer Housen, you're right, Spencer Housen doing the interview. My apologies, Spencer. Rob did a podcast with Janet recently, but yeah, Spencer Housen's going to do that. That's right. So there's some exciting things happening all around. So hope to get to see you. I'll be at all of the events. Hope to get to see you there. And I'm looking forward to that big hug. Yeah, well, nothing like a hug from me, let me tell you. <laughs> couple, of, couple of days' time. I'm looking forward to it. All right, thanks, Philip, and thank you all for tuning in. We will catch you next time. Bye, everyone. This has been The Sirens of Audio, episode 149, Randomoids 19, featuring the romance of crime and the English way of death, with our guests John Dorney and your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Our website is sirensofaudio.com. You can email us at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or contact us via any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time. <laughs>